So I want to thank uh, the directors and course directors. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to do that. I was assigned the task of renal artery stenting 2017, where do we stand? Which may more appropriately be termed, you see there's two lectures, Mark's given one about renal denervation next, two lectures devoted to renal stenting. Maybe we should have titled this The Death of Renal Artery Stenting, but I'll try to teach you a little bit about it. I have conflicts of, uh, have a couple of engagements, but none relevant to renal artery interventions. However, I do have to disclose to you that I am an interventionist. I have a cognitive mismatch and that I do believe open arteries are better than closed arteries. So let me start by first telling you the indications for renal artery revascularization. And if you look down here at the bottom, these are the ACCHA guidelines 2006. For hypertension, it's a class 2A indication for accelerated refractory or malignant hypertension and inability to tolerate medications. It has a 2A for bilateral or solitary renal artery stenosis, a 2B for unilateral renal artery stenosis. For the cardiac destabilization syndromes, it's a class 1 for flash pulmonary edema, or CHF, a class 2A for unstable angina. Now, though these are the 2006 guidelines, they were revamped in 2011. There was absolutely no changes to the top portion of this slide that you saw when these guidelines were updated. There are also anatomic criteria for renal revascularization. You need to know gradients are best measured with non-occlusive catheters or guide wires. A 50% to 70% stenosis is moderate, which requires you to have a at least 20 millimeter peak translational gradient or a 10 millimeter mean gradient, or a renal FFR less than 0.8. A severe stenosis is greater than 70%. Now, if you look at the hypertension response to renal stenting, and you look at this meta-analysis, you can see that there's roughly a 70% response to renal stenting for reduction in hypertension. Now, that leaves us with quite a paradox, and that paradox is that if we truly have, with endovascular therapy for peripheral disease, any artery, pick your artery, at least a 95% uh, uh, success rate, why do we only have a 70% clinical success rate in the renal vasculature? Are we treating non-obstructive lesions? Are we treating symptoms not related to renal artery stenosis? Do we overestimate diameter stenosis? Are we treating mild renal artery stenosis in people who actually have essential hypertension? So we have to do a little bit of reality testing. So you look at this stenosis with your eyeball, and is that a significant stenosis? Does it need to be fixed? Well, you have to compare apples to apples and not apples to bananas. The best practice is hemodynamic gradients for moderate stenoses. And a couple of bright guys, Neeson and Topol, coined this term back in the midst of the TIMI trials, uh, the oculostenotic reflex. You have to resist that urge. And it's the irresistible temptation to perform angioplasty on any significant residual stenosis and they were trying to get to the fact that we were all dilating these moderate stenoses after we had watched these arteries for 90 minutes, and then you take your angiogram, and the whole cath team's sitting there waiting to see if thrombolytic agents work or not, and then bam, if there's a 60% stenosis, well, I'm here in the middle of the night, I'm gonna treat it. You have to resert, resist the oculostenotic reflex. Perhaps the single weakest link for renal stenting is angiographic renal artery assessment, which has absolutely no correlation with any hemodynamic parameters, baseline, hyperemic gradient, or renal FFR. What does correlate, however, is baseline pressure gradient with your renal FFR, and you begin to get a high correlation coefficient here. So if you look at a renal FFR less than 0.8, you have an 87% predictive response uh, for treating uh, that renal artery for response to the hypertension, whereas if the FFR is greater than 0.8, you only have a 25% response. So what about gradients in hypertension? You look at their, and, and angiographic uh, stenosis. You look at this gradient of 57, which correlates angiographically with that lesion. You put a balloon in it, it's a 28 millimeter stenosis, and it looks like this angiographic image. But I would beg that this angiographic image is identical 
to this angiographic image. I don't see much different in the percent stenosis, yet one has a gradient of 28 and one has a gradient of zero. This elegant study uh, published by Magna Capri in 2010, uh, he looked at uh, mean at the, let's say look at the dopamine mean gradient to predict uh, the, a response of uh, hypertension to renal artery stenting. And in this curve, you can see at a, at a gradient of 20 millimeters of mercury, there's a specificity of roughly 75% to predict a response of hypertension to renal artery stenting. If you move up to, say, the 32, 33 millimeter gradient, whatever this is, that has a specificity of predicting almost a 95% response of renal stenting for the hypertension uh, response to that. So what about astral and STAR trials? Two randomized trials that demonstrated no benefit for renal stents published in reputable journals. The first one, the STAR trial, renal artery stenosis were greater than 50%. And what did I tell you? 50 to 70 is moderate stenosis. It requires other evaluation. Blood pressure was controlled on medical therapy with less than 140 over 90. That's JNC8 guidelines right now. Uh, Intracriteria GFR less than 80. 30% of people did not receive allocated stents. 20% of people had stenoses in the less than 50% range. And 10% of people, uh, uh, or 10% of patients had renal artery perforation. Certainly, the, the uh, interventionalist, you would not want to do your renal artery intervention. Astral trial, randomize if it's uncertain whether to revascularize or not. Well, if you're uncertain, you should do a test. You shouldn't, and if you're certain what you should do, then that's what you should do. So, in conclusion, they found substantial risk, no evidence of a worthwhile benefit for renal stenting for atherosclerotic disease. And look at the percent stenosis. Remember the moderate range? 40% of patients in both the medical and the revascularization arm were in the moderate stenosis range in that trial. They were mild lesions. And how were they assessed? Core lab oversight, IVAs, pressure gradients? No, no, and no. So the problems with the astral, why are you randomizing uncertain patients? I told you angiography is not uh, a way to evaluate moderate stenosis. A major complication rate of 10% is way out of line with contemporary studies. And 65% of all participating centers randomized less than one patient per year. So you are not statistically significant. Take home message, angiography and angiography I've said 10 times now is not adequate for mild lesions. Skill of interventionalist matters just as much as the surgeon. The STAR and astral trials are guilty of intellectual crimes against medicine. And the New England Journal and annual editors are indicted as co-conspirators, which led my boss and partner to publish this really humorous Kiss My Astral uh, editorial that I would encourage you all to read, uh, maybe when you're sitting in the bathroom. I don't know. But then we thought end all be all was Chris Cooper's coral trial. The coral trial, however, hypertension on greater than two antihypertensive drugs, CKD stage three, and an angiographic stenosis greater than 60%, right in the middle of where I told you moderate range was. I looked at the composite major uh, endpoint of cardiovascular and renal events that you see there and demonstrated no significant benefit for stenting with medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. Regardless of how you slice the pie into the individual components, except for there was a statistically significant numerical benefit for stents for blood pressure reduction, but I think you can all agree that three millimeters of mercury is clinically completely insignificant, so nobody cares. So in conclusion, renal artery stenting did not confer a benefit uh, for prevention of clinical events when added to multifactorial management of medical therapy, et cetera. So, but look at baseline characteristics, moderate range in both arms. The, the median stenosis was 67 and 66%. So let me make a shameless plug for randomized trials for parachutes. And this was published in British Journal of Medicine, Medicine 2003. So why do we need to do this for renal stents? If I designed a trial for parachutes, would I do it for jumping off a five-foot porch? No, because I know you don't need a parachute. Jumping out of an airplane at 1,000 feet, absolutely you need a parachute. You have to have a level of uncertainty or equipoise to design your randomized trial, and then you should obey 
the findings of a moderate stenosis. So, my last couple of slides is what about renal randomized trials? Need a level of uncertainty or equipoise. Less than 50%, you don't need renal stents. A greater than 50 to 70% moderate stenosis, absolutely you would stent. So this is a true patient, this is my last slide, presented when I was participating in a coral trial. Blood pressure 176 over 95, they were on five blood pressure medicines, serum creatinine was 1.6. Would you be willing to randomize this patient in the coral trial? I was participating in the coral trial, not me. I put stents in both sides. I wanna thank you very much. But had I put stents, that coral trial may have been a positive trial.